molecules form when atoms make bonds with other atoms. In this video, we're going to learn how atoms come together, what kind of different uh, bonds they form so that they can um, form molecules. Now, the first type of bond we're going to talk about are ionic bonds. And ionic bonds form just by the virtue of different atoms having an opposite electric charge. So let's go back to sodium chloride again. And we mentioned the um, tendency of atoms is to have a full outer electronic shell. So what happens in this case is that sodium will lose, will donate that one electron that it has on the third shell to chlorine, which only needs one more electron to fill the outer shell. Now, upon the loss of an electron, sodium, which originally was neutral, turns into a positively charged atom. And when chlorine picks up this extra electron, it turns into a negatively charged ion. And just by the fact that these two atoms have opposite charges, that it holds them together and forms an ionic bond. Just like in a piece of salt. So if you blow this up, you will see a lattice of sodium and chloride molecules interacting with one another via their, because of their opposite charges. Now another form of uh, molecular bonds are covalent bonds in which the atoms don't lose or gain electrons but actually they share electrons. So when atoms share a pair or more than a pair of electrons to complete their outermost shell, the resulting bond is called a covalent bond. So then when Molecules come together as a covalent bond, they form a molecule. Now let's talk about hydrogen. And here we have two hydrogen atoms. Each of them have only one electron in their outer shell. Now they only need one more. So in the hydrogen gas, when the hydrogen gas forms, these individual hydrogen molecules bring their own electron and share it with one another such that they're both now have a complete outer shell. So what do we mean by sharing electrons exactly? Well, it doesn't mean that these electrons are sitting in here all the time in the middle between the atom. It means that on average, these two electrons spend half of their time around one atom and half of their time around the other atom. So on average, both of these atoms get to have a complete outer shell. So um, one question is, how can we tell how many bonds an atom can form? Well, it really depends on how many electrons is present on the outer shell, which is also called the valence shell. In case of hydrogen, hydrogen only has one electron in its outer shell or valence shell, and it only needs one more electron to complete this shell. So all it needs is one, and therefore hydrogen can only make one bond with any other atom. Carbon, on the other hand, is different. So let me grab my pen. So carbon has an atomic number of six. So what would the, the um, electron distribution look like? So if this is the carbon nucleus, then in, in, in the innermost shell, there are two electrons. And then we got four more left. So we put the four more in the second shell. Now we know from the 288 rule that the second shell is full when it has eight electrons. 
So how many more electrons does carbon need in order to fill its outer shell? It's neither energetically favorable to lose all of these electrons or to just gain four electrons from another molecule. So what carbon does, it shares its electrons with four different molecules because it needs four additional electrons. The maximum number of bonds that carbon can make is four bonds. So now, if we grab another colored pen, and let's say with this hydrogen, so this hydrogen comes in and shares its electron with carbon. So therefore, carbon can form four bonds. So on and so forth. I'm not going to draw all of them. So just like in here, in the molecule of methane, you will see that carbon is making the maximum of four bonds, the, the total bonds that it can make. Now, in um, there we have situations where carbon forms bonds with oxygen in carbon dioxide, <clears throat> but it only forms bonds with two oxygens rather than four here. That's because it can form double bonds. So in this case, because oxygen needs two more electrons, oxygen can bring its two electrons and share. So oxygen brings its two electrons and carbon brings two electrons. So in here, so therefore, you form a double bond. And in this case, both atoms, all three of these atoms, have a complete outer electronic shell. So the total number of bonds an atom can make, it depends how many more electrons it needs to complete its outer electron shell. Now, work through this problem and come to the discussion to check your answer. Now, covalent bonds come in two different flavors. <clears throat> covalent bonds are either polar or they're nonpolar. So, this is a molecule of water and it is polar. The reason it is called polar because you can see that at its opposite poles, it has different charges. Charges, electrons and charges aren't distributed evenly across this molecule. But with respect to methane and molecular oxygen, <clears throat> the electrons are shared between molecules evenly. So there is no buildup of electron on one side uh, and, uh, and a lower amount of electron on the other side. Now, when a molecule is polar, uh, as we mentioned, one, some atoms gain a, positive a partial positive charge and some atoms gain, gain a partial negative charge. And we show the partial uh, designation by these little funny symbols, okay? so. What's the basis of that? It all comes to differences in the electronegativity of atoms that are bonding. Now, what is electronegativity? It's the affinity of an atom to pull its electrons towards itself. And if you look at the periodic table, as you move from the left-hand side to the right, electronegativity increases. So if you compare the molecule of hydrogen to, let's say, a molecule of uh, oxygen, um, oxygen has a much higher electronegativity than hydrogen. So now if we go back in here, because oxygen pulls electrons towards itself with much higher force, electrons end up spending more of their time around the oxygen molecule. So there's going to be a deficit in terms of the amount of time that the electrons spend around these hydrogen atoms. So when there is a big difference between the electronegativity of the atoms, then the molecule becomes polar. But when you compare carbon and hydrogen, 
there is a difference in their electronegativity, but it's not that much, uh, such that electrons pretty much spend e about equal time around these, mole in the, around these atoms. And with molecular oxygen, well, these are exactly the same um, atoms, and they have exactly the same electronegativity. Now, as a rule of thumb, when the electronegativity difference between two atoms is less than 0.5, then the molecule is nonpolar. But if the electronegativity is more than 0.5, then the molecule and the bond becomes polar. Now, this is a rule of thumb. It's, of course, there are exceptions and specific conditions, but in general, um, if the difference between electronegativity of two atoms is less than 0.5, then the bond that they form is not polar. And if the difference in electronegativity is more than 0.5, then that bond tends to be polar. So here it is again in the periodic table. As you go from left to right, electronegativity differences increases. And if you go, as you go down, electronegativity actually decreases.